Greetings to you and welcome to this, your core one supervisory training. This online component is separated into three parts and indeed three short films. We start with admissions and induction, then we get into the crunchy bit of the candidature itself and we finish off with the examination. So we'll call this core one, but there's parts A, B and C. This is of course part A. So this core probe some of the key andragogical challenges that we currently face in doctoral education. So when we admit a candidate into our program, how important is the ability of the candidate and how important is the quality of the project itself? And how do we assess that right at the start? Are there predictors of success and failure? Can we predict withdrawals? from our doctoral program and also what is your role as a supervisor in the success and the failure of your PhD students. We all know, don't we, those students who have passed out their PhD with no supervision or very, very poor supervision, we all know those people. But the question is, is that what you want for this university? Is this what you want for yourself? Is this what you want for our students? So I argue that the supervisory relationship is the key factor in moving from simply compliance in doctoral education to excellence in doctoral education. It's the supervisory relationship that makes that difference. So how do you know upon receiving an email from a student whether or not they're going to be able to complete a PhD? What are the proxies that are going to enable you to make that decision? What are you looking for? And indeed, are you looking for the right attributes? And similarly, when a student contacts you, a prospective student contacts you, what proxies do they require to understand whether or not you'll be a great supervisor? Do they look at your reputation? Do they look at your PhD completions? Do they look at your publications? The answer is probably all of the above. So let's start with the admissions process. So you receive an email from a prospective student asking for you to consider to be their supervisor. What do you do? Well, the first thing you do is you ascertain their eligibility. And there's some easy ways to do this and some hard ways to do this, some crunchy ways and some smooth ways. The easy way into a doctoral program is to have first class honours, 2A honours or a master's program. So that's great. In, out, shake it all about. Fantastic. The interesting bit of this narrative, though, is that alternative pathways into a doctoral program, they are increasing. And we have a fantastic graduate diploma in research methods that we offer at this university that is increasingly being used as the way for guys and gals without an honours qualification. But it is very important, even at these early stages, to understand the whole person. For example, I took on a student that had 2B honours and that student finished in three years and that PhD went on to be a rather famous scholarly monograph. Now, he was an internationally famous musician. A lot of my former PhD students have been musicians and have been DJs. That's a whole other story, bless. It certainly makes it interesting, but it does mean you have to explore the entirety of their career. And I let this young man in and it was a correct decision, but it was a risk and there are ways to mitigate that risk. The key, I think, at this early stage is to look at a skill assessment. What skills do they have? What skills will they need to develop? And know that at Flinders University, we have this incredible portfolio of professional development programs that can swing in and help with those skill development issues. A lot of what we're talking about these days is about research training. Now, I'm not the biggest fan of that phrase. I lost that battle a decade ago. But when we're talking about research training, it is significant to think about how your individual discipline understands it. It differs incredibly from the hard sciences to the high humanities, and also how the understanding of research training has changed through our careers as well. So when we admit students into a program, we take a risk, a risk. 
I'm not a Time Lord. Trust me, I so wish I was a Time Lord, but I'm not a Time Lord. So I can't get into my TARDIS and travel three and a half years in the future and see that student walking across that graduation stage. I can't know that. I can't see that. So there's always a risk. But therefore, consider how we mitigate risk through the admissions issue. It is also very important to balance social justice and opportunity. That's increasingly complex and it requires judgment. It requires listening to what the student is telling you. And also, like most doctoral education, it involves managing the shades of grey. International doctoral education right now lives on a spectrum. And that spectrum moves from compliance through to excellence. And these two core modules are about moving you from compliance to excellence. But admission to our program is not only about the student, it's also about you as a supervisor. A great doctoral candidate and a great doctoral project can be destroyed through poor supervision. So you really matter to this story. Lives can be destroyed, money and time can be wasted. And an understudied area of doctoral education I'm really looking at at the moment is the number of relationship breakdowns and divorces that happen during a student's candidature because of the stress. So this is a very serious series of issues. We have an incredible duty of care towards our doctoral candidates. And you'll hear me talk about duty of care a lot. It matters. We have to care. We have to understand the whole person as much as the PhD itself. So if we stuff up in doctoral education, we take their dreams away from them. We take away the trajectory, the hopes, the inspiration, the aspiration, the future of what these students think they can be. We can damage their bank balance, their family, their friends when we make errors. So the pressure on us to be our best selves is enormous. So whenever you hear anyone in the higher education sector around the world abusing stuff like supervisory training, like we're doing here, or a supervisory register, or supervisory professional development, whenever you hear anybody laughing about it or mocking it, you might remind them of the damage the deep and dark damage that poor supervision can do to a student's life. Flinders operates, like most universities operate around the world, a supervisory register. Now, yes, registers operate at the compliance end of the spectrum because we need to guarantee that every single student at this university has a minimum level of supervisory ability. We also enforce, and I'm very proud of this, research activity in our supervisors. Five refereed articles must be completed in the five years of assessment, so that's the previous five years that we're assessing, and I'm very proud of that. They can be co-authored so that we're not harming or undermining the expertise of our colleagues in the science end of the spectrum. And there are indeed many reasons why we insist on this research activity, because yes, research activity is a proxy for research ability, but it also means, and this is actually more important for my particular perspective, it means that you've been verified by referees continually in the previous five years. So those referees are stating you are working at an appropriate scholarly standard in the field and in disciplinary terms you know what's going on in your discipline. It also demonstrates that you have command of academic protocols. It also shows that you are active in the field and, and that matters because the characteristic of a PhD is that they offer an original contribution to knowledge. So how would you know what an original contribution to knowledge is if you're not research active in your field? You might just like to ponder that. Our students, let alone our quality assurance agencies around us, require an array of markers and indicators that we as supervisors remain scholarly learners, engaging with knowledge, being research active, being excited about being a scholar, continually improving our andragogy through professional development. So the compliance elements of our policy are this supervisory training, 
but also our supervisory register and yearly assessment for that register on the basis of your research activity. So that's our baseline, but we are Flinders, we are better than that. So between our wonderful faculties at this university and the Office of Graduate Research, we create that culture of excellence, of reflection, of consciousness. So what I really want for all of us as scholars is we continue to learn, we continue to test ourselves, we continue to gain consciousness, if you like, about what we don't know so we can improve our practice. And unless we've got that type of learning culture, we start to confuse experience with expertise. And in a university, that's a bit of a worry. So if we think we are experienced as a supervisor, then we're actually not participating in a learning culture that arches us beyond individual experience and into knowledge, into learning. So bottom line, our supervisory eligibility is based on qualification. So you've got to hold it to teach it. You have to hold it to supervise it. You've got to have a doctorate to be able to supervise a doctorate. Baseline stuff, thanks for playing. You also must have full academic status, be available for full-time candidature, and that you have the ability to give your student the time they require that you're not going to leave the university. And of course you must be research active. To be a principal supervisor, you've got to have a record of successful completion. But I'm a big believer in succession planning and a big hello to all the wonderful new supervisors who haven't supervised before. Let me tell you what we do. We give you the associate supervisor status so you gain the mentoring, you gain the expertise to reach that principal status. So we will look after you so you have a great research trajectory and supervisory trajectory in front of you. I promise we will care for your career. So I'm terribly proud of the standards of supervision that we require at Flinders and it is important we always remember why these standards are in place. As a supervisor you have so many responsibilities. You've got to understand the arc the trajectory of the resource, understand particularly resourcing in that research. You've got to look at the monitoring of the training programs in place, ensure compliance with a whole series of Australian codes for the responsible conduct of research, and also demonstrate really strong communication skills. Yes, with your postgraduate student, but also with your associate supervisors. You have to be available, you have to be responsive, you have to monitor process, Process. You have to teach the students as much as facilitate and guide them, and you also have to select examiners. It's a big and it's a frightening job. This is an incredible array of functions, but you have a whole series of policy and procedures that can help you. The Office of Graduate Research is at your disposal. My door, this is my office, my door is always open and I'd love to have you sit down, we'll have a cup of coffee and talk through any issues, any concerns, any great stuff that's happening. I love to hear about it. So my door is open. You also have fantastic postgraduate coordinators, associate deans of research within your faculty and of course you can work with the colleagues in my office, the Office of Graduate Research at any time. You're not flying solo, a stack of people really care about you and care about your students. So use the resources that are available to you. And look, I really understand that doctoral education is daunting. It is frightening, and to be frank with you, it should be frightening. I have supervised so many students to completion, and every new stu student, I still have a twist in my stomach. I still am frightened for them. I will still do anything in my power to make sure that they get through in the minimum time and are happy through the process. We should be stressed, because somebody has put their lives in our hands. So we've discussed admissions of the students to our program and the supervisors into the register. Let's now finish off this first little bit by looking at student induction. Now, twice a year, we run a PhD student induction. It has an online component, really the same as we're doing with you guys now, and also an analogue face-to-face component. These sessions are run in partnership between the Office of Graduate Research and your faculty. These are 
orientations and the old-fashioned meaning of that word. Remember this stuff? So we're orienting the students. We're giving them a map of what their candidature will look like. The completion of this online and analogue induction component is also recorded in the students' records as well. So this induction is really the start of what we do, as I think it's part of section 13 of the Research Higher Degrees Policies and Procedures, we have this fantastic array of professional development programs for your students. I think this is what marks Flinders as one of the best universities to do a PhD on the planet because we have these incredible value-add skill programs about their career, about completion, about working inside and outside a university during the candidature, after the candidature. We are getting them ready for the rest of their life. So these are incredible programs. Please use them. Those programs are online right now. Your students can enrol right now. And they include career development and also leadership workshops. And also, and I can't really encourage your participation in these programs enough, we have specifically targeted workshops for students to understand the first year of the candidature, the second year of the candidature, and of course the crunchy one, the final year of the candidature. I really recommend these to your students so they understand the expectations, the contour and the shape of their PhD. So these programs exist from this office and are available for all candidates. We know of course your wonderful schools, your wonderful faculties run a whole series of workshops and conferences and well as well and we recommend that students participate strongly in those. So the key I think is to become very aware of your faculty milestones to completion. And what we're increasingly doing at the university is bringing all the faculty milestones together so we can all agree, in fact, on university milestones. You need to really put attention on those milestones because that will get your student to completion. So now that we've introduced, what have we done? We've done admissions, we've done induction. The second part of our core is going to jump into the full candidature uh, and look at the challenges and the fabulous things that happen there. So thank you for being a part of this part A. Let's now move to part B.